Our next presenter, uh, once again, needs no introduction. Dr Francis Gurry holds a PhD uh, from Cambridge, uh, has been working uh, with the World Intellectual Property Organisation since uh, about 1985 and in uh, 2009 was appointed the Director General. It's our very great pleasure to uh, have Francis Gurry here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Um, the Attorney has just, just left us, the Honourable Inter Attorney General. Uh, the Honourable Michael Kirby, Professor Adrian Sterling. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a really a great pleasure for me to be here. Let me start by also acknowledging the traditional owners of this very beautiful land uh, where we are meeting today. Um, I would uh, like to commend also uh, QUT and in particular Brian Fitzgerald and Ben Atkinson in uh, taking up the gauntlet thrown down by the Digital Society. I think there are a few issues of intellectual property law and, if I may say, cultural policy, which are more important than uh, the, radical, the consequences of the radical structural change that has been introduced by digital technology and the internet. Uh, the consideration of that or the recognition of the importance of the issue has moved to a higher level recently, as some of you may have seen with both uh, Professor, Sarko uh, Professor President Sarkozy of France and President Medvedev of uh, the Russian Federation calling for the G20 to look at the issue of copyright and the impact of the internet in particular. And let me read just uh, two sentences from what President Medvedev said uh, at the opening ceremony of uh, the Davos Economic World Economic Forum this year. Uh, he said that the old principles of intellectual property regulation are not working anymore, particularly when it comes to the internet. And that, he stated, is fraught with the collapse of the entire intellectual property rights system. So as we know, uh, digital technology and the internet have created the most powerful instrument for the democratization of knowledge since really the invention of movable type uh, for use in the printing press. Uh, they've introduced perfect fidelity and near zero marginal costs for the reproduction of cultural works and an enormous and unprecedented capacity to distribute those works uh, at instantaneous speeds and again at near zero marginal costs. But the promise that, uh, that the internet and digital technology offer of universal access to cultural works has come with a process of creative destruction uh, that has shaken the foundations of our pre-digital cultural industries, creative industries. Uh, and underlying that process of change that we are seeing every day is a fundamental question, and I think it is the fundamental question of copyright policy or of cultural policy, really, and that is how can society make available cultural works at an affordable price and to the widest possible audience while at the same time returning some economic value to the creators, the performers, and to their business associates that help them to navigate the economic system. And that, as the attorney has said, implies a series of balances. It's the balance between, on the one hand, the availability of cultural works, and on the other hand, the deliberate restriction or control of the distribution of works in order to be able to extract some value to return to the creators, uh, performers, and their business associates. It's a, it's a balance between, on the one hand, consumers, and on the other hand, producers. A balance between the individual uh, on the one hand, and society, and a balance between short-term gratification uh, <coughs> of the immediate consumption of cultural works, uh, and on the other hand, the long-term process of creating a, appropriate incentives to ensure that we have a dynamic cultural uh, life in the community. Digital technology, of course, the digital revolution, has had a radical impact on those balances that are supposed to have been built into our copyright system. Uh, and in particular, I would suggest uh, that the impact has been to give the technological advantage to one side of the equation, uh, the side of availability, 
the side of uh, social enjoyment, the side of immediate gratification. Uh, but, as we know, it is impossible to reverse uh, any technological advantage. And rather than resist it, I think it's very, very clear now that what we have to do is to seek an intelligent engagement with that technological advantage. And the copyright system has either to adapt or it will perish. The process of adaption, adaptation, uh, I would suggest, is one that requires activism and not mere uh, passive reaction. I think there is a very great danger in a passive reaction to what is happening, and that danger is basically the abandonment of public policy, because uh, the decisions on copyright policy and on cultural policy will be taken rather on the basis of a Darwinian system of the survival of the fittest business model. And that fittest business model may contain the right balances that we seek as a matter of, of uh, social policy, but it also may not contain the right balances. It's a question of chance, and I don't think that the balances should be left merely to a question of technological possibility and the business responses to technological possibility. Rather, uh, I think it is a better uh, policy to uh, create the balances as a matter of conscious design. When it comes to that conscious design, uh, I don't think that there is any single magical answer to the problem. Uh, rather, I think uh, that uh, a combination of law, of infrastructure, um, of cultural change, of institutional collaboration, uh, and I had a fifth one, which will come to me, business models. Those five things, I think, are five elements that we need in a comprehensive uh, business uh, policy response to the digital revolution. Let me take each of those and comment on it very briefly because each of them really deserves a, a, a lengthy uh, analysis. First of all, law. I think for many uh, decades, if not centuries, we have looked to law to provide the answers for copyright policy. Um, and I, I would suggest that uh, law must remain the final arbiter, but we face circumstances in the internet in which, uh, as a result of the loose regulation of the domain name system, which allows a, a, a great degree of anonymity, as a result of the multi-jurisdictional nature of the internet, and as a result of the multiplicity of transactions that take place, the sheer volume of transactions that take place on the internet, uh, law is a much less potent instrument in the digital environment than it is in the physical world. It is a mere shadow of itself in the physical world. And in consequence, I think the culture of the internet is such that platforms influence behavior as much, if not more, than law. But recognising the limitation of law, I think, should not mean that we simply abandon it. There are very many important legal questions, and the attorney has mentioned a number of them, that do need consideration. And I would suggest that the, the key question, the one that requires the most focus on the part of the international community, is the question of intermediaries. And I would misuse the civil law uh, description of responsibility uh, as opposed to liability. The responsibility, what is the responsibility of intermediaries in this uh, internet world? Uh, because they are, they perform many different roles, I think. They're service providers, uh, but on the other hand, they're also partners and competitors and even substitutes for uh, creators, performers and their business associates. And it's that confusion of roles, I think, which makes it rather difficult to be able to determine what is the right approach to adopt to the question of intermediaries. Um, as I've hinted uh, with respect to the limitation of law, I think that infrastructure has an, an extremely important part to play in the solution. 
And here, let me suggest that we dare to say that the infrastructure of the copyright system of the physical world, namely collective management, needs reform. Uh, and it needs reform because it reflects a world uh, it, it, that is, first of all, territorial, and secondly, where right holders express themselves in different media. And it doesn't reflect the world, uh, the non-territorial or international medium of the internet, and it doesn't reflect the convergence of expression of cultural works in the internet. But saying that the world of collective management and collecting societies need to evolve is not to say that they don't have a role. In fact, I think it would be a very big mistake to suggest that they don't have a role. I think we do need a global infrastructure and one that permits simple licensing, one that makes it as easy to get content uh, legally on the internet as it is to get content illegally. Uh, Time doesn't really permit me to go into all the details of what such infrastructure might look at, and it's been discussed in many, many contexts, but let me repeat two messages from recent conferences. Uh, the first is that I do think the initiative to build a global repertoire database or an international music registry is a very important stepping stone in providing an infrastructure for simple global licensing a global database which would be owned by the data providers. It would be an essential piece of global infrastructure, a free public good, uh, and upon which people could build whatever business model they wished. And I think that is a very important uh, first step to take in building a global, truly global infrastructure. And the second message that I would pass uh, is that uh, I don't think we should conceive of global infrastructure as replacing collecting societies. That will never happen. Uh, I think what we should rather conceive of it as is somewhat in a similar way to the development of the Patent Cooperation Treaty, in which, uh, which casts a procedural net linking all of the patent offices of the world. It does not replace them. So the role of global infrastructure, I think, can only uh, take place if with the cooperation of and with the full support of the collecting societies themselves. Beyond law and infrastructure, a third element, I think, of the response uh, is culture, of course. Uh, and the internet has, of course, developed its own culture. Uh, we have even a, a political party uh, whose platform is based on the abolition or radical reform of intellectual property in general and, and copyright in particular, the Pirate Party. Uh, and let me read from its platform. It says that the monopoly of the copyright holder to exploit an aesthetic work commercially should be limited to five years after publication. A five years copyright term for commercial use is more than enough. Uh, Non-commercial use should be free from day one. Now, the Pirate Party may be an extreme expression, but I think we have to acknowledge that actually it expresses a sentiment that is rather widespread. And that sentiment is a certain distaste for or dislike of copyright on the internet. And I think we need to reflect about that as a copyright community. There are many people who don't like it. Uh, and why is that the case? Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, we know, uh, and, and I suppose it's evidence of it, it, it is that there, it, when you look at the widespread piracy that takes place, the widespread illegal downloading of music, for example, we may argue about the methodology to measure uh, illegal downloading, but we all know that it takes place on an extraordinarily extensive scale in society, regardless of the methodology we use to measure it. Now, in order to change cultural attitudes here, my suggestion would be that we should stop speaking about piracy, <clears throat> that we should desist from calling... People don't like being called pirates, as a matter of fact, or if they do, then they take a pride in it. Uh, and I think we need to reformulate the question that we're confronting here. 
And that question is nothing, I think, you know, less dramatic than the survival of how do you finance culture in the digital environment. We all want music, we all want literature, we all want uh, films, but who's going to pay for them in the digital environment? And copyright has traditionally performed that role of being the financing mechanism for creative uh, content and for the development of uh, creative content and for reward of creators. It is not working as it should be. Uh, we need to confront that fact and we need to, uh, I think, uh, ask society to share responsibility for the development of a sensible cultural policy and copyright policy uh, rather than attack them as pirates all the time. That would be my suggestion in relation to the cultural change that's necessary. Two other elements of a comprehensive policy, just to mention very, very briefly, uh, are um, in the fourth place institutional collaboration, which is the artist formerly known as enforcement. Uh, institutional collaboration is required if we are going to make any headway in relation to this question. Uh, and I think when one looks around the world in relation to institutional collaboration, one sees a fair degree of incoherence. There are national approaches, there are the, the, the Adopi law, there is the Adopi law, for example, uh, the Digital Economy Act in the UK, uh, there are approaches which target the consumer. There are approaches which target intermediaries or uh, ISPs. Uh, there are national approaches, there are plurilateral approaches with ACTA, and there's very little that takes place at the international level. Very, very little. Uh, and I think that's a reflection of a more general question internationally, uh, we have been very good as an international community over uh, since the period of the Second World War in developing laws, but very bad at developing institutional mechanisms for ensuring the respect for those laws. And here is one such example. Um, but I do think we do need a, a, a coherent design uh, a d approach to the question of institutional collaboration. My final uh, point then uh, in the design um, of a comprehensive and coherent response to the digital revolution is better business models. And we know that this is now happening, but uh, the story is far from being over, and I would suggest that we need to constantly remind ourselves that the history of the confrontation of the classical copyright system and digital technology has been more a sorry tale of Luddite resistance than a story of intelligent engagement. And that, I think, is very important for how we go forward in the future because, as I said, we're far from, this is, uh, question is far from over. Let me make two final remarks, if I may. <coughs> um, I have stressed that I think uh, there's no single magical answer we need a comprehensive policy in our, uh, covering all those elements of law, infrastructure, um, cultural change, institutional collaboration, and better business models. It's only through a combination of all of that. But let me say two final things about copyright law. One is that uh, it goes without saying for me, but let me say it nevertheless, that copyright law should be neutral to technology and to the business responses to technology. It is not the role of, tech, uh, of copyright law to favour one particular technological approach or one particular business response to new technologies, nor, it is the, nor is it the role of copyright law to prop up business models based on moribund or out obsolete technology. Uh, <coughs> copyright law has to be neutral. It has to find the mechanism uh, uh, that works whatever the technology uh, is that is deployed for creative works. And finally, um, let me just suggest that uh, we need more simplicity in copyright. 
Copyright's a very complex and complicated world. And it is so because it reflects the successive waves, as the attorney again has said, the successive waves <clears throat> of new technological expressions of creative works, from printing through to digital technology. Uh, in consequence, it's very highly complex and complicated. And I think we risk losing our audience and our public, and I think this is part of the cultural battle. Uh, <laughs> we risk if we can't make understanding of the system more accessible. Uh, future generations are clearly going to regard many of the works and the rights and the business ag agents that we talk about as cute artefacts of cultural history, much as the vinyl record has become. Uh, <clears throat> and we see that the digital work uh, itself is very much changing dimensions. We see that with user-generated con uh, content, and we see it also with 3D printing or additive ma manufacturing, where the digital file itself is the manufacturing technology, if not the factory. Uh, so some thought, perhaps, in since this is a blue sky conference, uh, some thought, I think, needs to be given to whether we should have digital works themselves as objects of uh, protection. It's, um, once again, a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.